Well, the first thing uh, that I noticed in the program is um, a change in the, in the verb from had to has uh, presents me as the person who had memorized the Masnavi. But in fact, it was in the past tense referring to my teacher, Ros Muhammad Zare, who had nearly memorized all of the Masnavi. Maybe if I had 20 lifetimes, I could approach that. But I just wanted to clarify that. Um, the, my talk is um, the Masnavi Rumi's profound understanding of the human condition. And you may, you may know that, um, do you want me to move this closer or? Uh, the Masnavi is often described as the Quran in Persian or as a commentary on all of the scripture, including the Hadith. And those of us who read the Masnavi daily, we work our way through it. Um, I, have, I have read through it on a number, number of times, maybe 10, 15, 20 times, as I'm sure all of you lovers of the Masnavi would have done. And as you do so, we realize that yes, it is, a commentary on the Quran and Hadith, but at the same time, arguably, we could say that Rumi has really tried to explain the meaning of all human experience, all levels of human experience. And so we find anything from very sober commentaries to ecstatic poetry about spiritual love. And at the same time, we find that he loves to pun, that he loves jokes. Some of the stories in the Masnavi are much more than racy. They are racier than anything I've read in the English language. I can read some of these stories and one has to ask, what did he have in mind? Some scholars and theologians rejected the Masnavi and they said, it is so filthy, you would need tongs to pick it up. You should not pick it up with your own hands. What did he have in mind? Maybe he not only wanted people to become more religious, but he didn't want them to become hypocrites or to feel higher or better than other people. Maybe he wanted to give us a book that was about the human experience, all levels of the human experience. And the first poem that I want to read to you is a translation. I looked for a while at the different poems that I liked very much in the Masnavi, and I was trying to choose a poem for my friend, Leonard Lewis, and his widow is with us tonight, as we said earlier. And she hasn't heard the poem yet either, the one, but I tried to find something that had that a uh, human sensibility of profound friendship, um, connection, and so I'm going to read that to you first. Could I trouble you for a bottle of water? Thank you. Love and imagination invoke a hundred Josephs with greater magic 
than what fallen angels used. Creating of memory your loved one's form whose allure has you speaking to it with ever so many disclosures of the kind that friends and lovers share. No form and no shape are actually there, yet so many words of, am I not? Yes, you are. Like the heartbroken mother when, at the grave of her child just taken, whispers her secrets with a passion that would animate lifeless stone. She knows the soil as alive and restored. She perceives the corpse as attentive. Her agitation confers ears and eyes on every speck of dirt in that grave. In her grief, she knows the soil is hearing. Oh, see what miracle-working love can do. She lowers herself on the fresh grave, tenderly, breath to breath, pressing to it her teary face. In life, she had never brought her face so close as she now holds it to, to her dear son. So there's an example of an aspect of human experience that is in the Masnavi that allows us to appreciate um, the sensitivity of his poetry in places. Some places it could be more dogmatic and religious. In most of the Masnavi, it is spiritual. And both speakers have brought up the image common in all of Asia at that time of the ocean representing reality. And Rumi is very fond of this image. So when I talk about his profound understanding, he is really coming from this place of this metaphor, very common in Japan at that time with Zen Buddhists, very common in India, of the ocean of reality and the waves on the surface. And Rumi uh, is particularly fond of this image because he says, I love all of these stories. And as you know, he's using stories from the Quran, from Hadith, but he's using stories from uh, India, tales of Bitpai. He's using stories from the Far East, from North Africa. He's using any story that appeals to him at that moment that he can make use of. And he says, what I will do, I will use those stories and I will try to improve upon them. So in the case of this metaphor of the ocean and the waves, he realizes is that there is a convenient um, identity in the word, the, the word for the spray or the foam on the waves, kaf. It has the same meaning in Persian as the palm of the hand. And so those of you who are aware of these poems of his, he likes to explain how using the story in the elephant in the dark room, 
He likes to explain how those people in the earlier versions of the story, they're touching the elephant, and none of them can grasp the totality of the elephant. So for Rumi, there's a wonderful shift in that particular poem where he is playing upon the idea of the limitation of the hand, of the palm of the hand, and therefore the limitation of being on top of the waves where the spray, so you have kaf on the surface of the ocean and you have kaf on the palm of the hand. So I'm going to read to you a few lines from some of those poems. The thing that we do want to understand is that Rumi often speaks about what we would call the fertile void, non-being. Adam in Arabic and Nisti in Persian. And by that, he sometimes means it personally. A person becomes minus themselves and they encounter the love that Dr. Surush was talking about. But sometimes Rumi means that it is the domain, the greater domain of receptivity, the source of things, the ocean, vast, the wind of desire, hawa, beautiful in Persian, not only the atmosphere, but the desire. Rumi is always aware of the relationship of words, synonyms, homonyms, tajnis, a lot of punning. And so what we see um, is for him, the ocean, it comes into activity from I was a hidden treasure and I love to be known. Hawa, the desire that starts this ocean of possibility, pregnant with possibility, brings it into agitation. Foam arises on the surface and the wave, each wave, separates out. It no longer feels that it is part of the ocean at the level of the spray. If it should dive within itself, it may find the water that makes up the wave. If it dives further, it may find that that water is the totality of the ocean. So the metaphor for Rumi is along those lines. But for us, in the English language, given the literature and poetry and such that we are used to, we could think of this best as the fertile void. So I'm going to give you a couple of selections of the example where he says, the eyes of the senses are like the palm of the hand. The palm of the hand cannot grasp the whole. The ocean's eyes are other than foam. Ignore the spray at the surface. See with oceanic eyes. The foam is surging day and night. You see the foam, but not the ocean. How strange. We are like boats tossed about on the sea, blind while sailing on a luminous ocean. You've fallen asleep in the vessel of the body. You've seen water peer into the water of waters. This vast water is what moves the waters. The Supreme Spirit that communes with all spirits. Moving from that stanza, 
from book three to book six. Dissolve the whole of your body in vision. Travel in vision, go in vision, only vision. Dar budos in jum latan ro, dar basar, dar nazar ro, dar nazar ro, dar nazar. Now you've heard, now that you've heard of the sea of non-being, strive constantly to reach it and to abide there. When you see the dawn light, blow out the candle. When your eyes become penetrating, that's his light. That light sees the kernels within the husks. Inside of the atom, it sees the eternal sun. It sees all of the vast ocean within a drop. This is a, a small sampling of the kind of poetry that Rumi uses a great deal of. Metaphor of the ocean, the waves, if we go further, we can imagine the implicit energy, the inclinations within divinity that manifest as the divine names. Kulu yaumen hua fishan, currents, so every day bring on new forms deep within the ocean and the waves of desire of I was a hidden treasure, blowing across, raising up the individual waves. So it's very beautiful. However, there is no particular metaphor that can capture the, the actuality completely, because the actuality is experience. So he makes sure to use other examples throughout the Masnavi. There's literally dozens of different examples he says, Machu Kohim was Sada that Mositus. Machu Naim, Wanama, Wanawa that Mositus. He says, uh, We are like the mountainside, but the echo coming from it is with you. We are like the reed flute, but the melody coming is from you. And he loves to use the image of the reed. So he says, because for him it means non-being. See? So, so it's the same as the opening of Masnavi, where he's using this image. So uh, these are just a couple of ideas for us to think about in the West. All people all beings, they are coming out of the fertile void. It's the origin. Returning there is to be free from the foam, the spray on the surface of the wave. Instead of falling badly in love, as Dr. Surush was uh, explaining, one could fall into the wave, the water within the wave, into the ocean, you see, deeper and deeper into the ocean of real love. So the so there's this paradox, you see, where he was talking about the palm of the hand and he's wanting us to understand the place of the senses, the, pl the position of the senses in his uh, experience of spirituality and mysticism. So uh, at the end of uh, the, the first example that I was giving you about the sea. He says, Hushra Bigzor, Wa Ongo Hushdor. Gushra Barband, Wa Ongo Gushdor. So he's explaining uh, give up your consciousness, your awareness, and become aware. Plug your ear so that you become hearing. So there's a, a movement from the senses, from the outer senses to the inner senses. 
He says, Panj Hesi As. Chose in Panj Hes. On to Zarisotwa, in Hes Ha, to Mes. He says, There are five senses other than these five senses. These extra five senses, they are like red gold, they say, because in the East, the gold is beautiful, huh? Red gold. It's a little bit more red than what we have in the Western world. Uh, he says, those senses, they are like red gold, and these senses you're using, they're copper. So immediately the image or the idea of alchemy comes into play. And many, many poems about transformation, about alchemy. And uh, because of time, I'm going to limit myself. But what I want to do is I want to now move to an example um, D despite the, the range of the Masnavi, I don't know of any book in any language that has the range of the Masnavi. And nevertheless, we can be sure that it is informed for him by the Quran and Hadith. And, and whereas Theologians may wish for you to move away from the fray of the waves. Rumi explains that all of life is connected and that you will necessarily be living in the domain of the waves and the ocean. And that would be actually a complete way for you to understand your fellow human. And, uh, but I wanted to pick a poem that I thought was also appropriate to our beloved brothers and sisters. We have some of us, like myself, we are Sunni. Some of the people, they are Shia. How wonderful, how wonderful this beautiful diversity of our faith. How wonderful Christians, Jews, all of us together, all bringing beauty and special facet of our gems. In this poem that I wish to read to you, he is commenting on a saying, and the saying is hadith from the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam. And he says, uh, he says, Man kuntu maulahu fa'aliyun karamalahu wajhu maulahu. He says, um, uh, for whomever I am a protector, Hazrat Ali is also his protector. Okay? In this case, Mawla means, means this idea, as in that culture you needed a protector. Hazrat Ali is the first person to stand up for Prophet Muhammad and to defend him, you see? He is the fountain of Sufi spirituality. So among us, we are one people. And Rumi, the question was, what is Rumi today? Rumi is one of the figures who can bring us together, who can make us denounce, reject, strike, rejection of other faiths. Rumi is the one who can help us to not accept that point of view. And all the Masnavi is focused in this direction. So the poem that I want to read to you, it also, it because it, it's so, I was trying to find the sensitive poems that I knew about. And that's the last poem I'm going to read to because of time, but I want you to understand how beautiful it is. So A, it's, it, it's based on his giving a commentary on this idea of whoever Prophet Muhammad is a protector for, 
Prophet Muhammad says, and Ali is also your protector. Okay, so that's the basis of this. Second point is the imagery is, again, this imagery is about water. And we can, we have to imagine the Quranic verses he's referring to. So, in this verse, the verse goes, um, and on the earth there are tracts of farmland, uh, and there are gardens of grape vines and grains and date palms, which are either single stalk, multiple stalk palms. <clears throat> they are watered by a single water. And we, uh, we raise some above others in terms of their, um, their nourishment, their giving of nourishment. We raise some of these above others, of these farmlands. Surely in this is uh, a true sign for a people who will think about it. وَفِي الْعَرْدِ قِتَاءٌ وَتَجَوِرَاتٌ وَجَنَّاتٌ سَنْوَانٌ وَغَيْرِ سَنْوَانٍ يُسْقَى بِمَاءٍ وَاحِدٍ وَنُفَادِلُ بَعْدَهُ عَلَى بَعْدًا بِالْأُكُلِ إِنَّ فِي ذَلِكَ لَآيَاتٍ لِقَوْمٍ عَقِلُونَ See, so this is what the, the, the Quranic verse is. Please remember that when I'm reading the poem, because we have to try to explain how did the poem become so rich, sensual, um, magnificent? How did it, it's hard for a translator to translate such a beautiful poem, but I'm gonna give you what I have tried to do with it. Oh, one last thing we should remember about the poem and his attitude towards spirituality. Uh, he, he quotes his mentor, his, his, uh, not in his life, the, his predecessor, Hakim Sanai, Hoshbayon um, on Hakim Rasnavi, Barema Juban Misolema Navi, Kizir Koran Gar Nabinad Rayrekad, In Ajar Nabuad Se Ashob Zalab, Kaz Shaoye of Tabe Pursinur. Okay, this is the, the, he's quoting. With the simile, the sage of Ghasna spoke clearly for the sake of those veiled from divine reality. Only seeing the overt sense of the Quran's words is not surprising from a people who have lost their way. Since the blind eye only perceives the warmth emanating from the radiant beams of the sun. So this is a lovely image, don't you think? Imagine, there's nothing wrong with the warm beams of the sun. It feels good. But the eye can see many light years away, immediately see the stars from out there. There's a difference, an inconceivable difference. And Rumi is saying, the, the literalist, person who doesn't grasp the meaning of Qur'an, they are like the blind person who only feels the warmth of the sun. So to escape this trap of literalism, not only that, but we don't even have to say it that way. We could say, to accept the beauty of the literal meaning, but to seek the experience that it promises, which is not the same thing as the outward words, you see. So now I'm going to read you the poem and then something much more interesting than talking will occur because some music I think is going to happen. But this poem, remember what it's about, huh? So who is a true protector? Whoever frees you, 
Whoever splits slavery's shackle from your ankle. Since prophecy is the true guide to freedom, the faithful find liberation through the prophets. So be joyful, O company of the faithful. Be free as the cypress and the lily. Yet with each breath, give thanks to water, wordlessly as a rose garden of mirthful hues. The cypress and green meadow speak wordlessly, thanking water, thanking the measure of budding spring. Decked out in elegant robes and trailing their skirts, they're drunk and dancing, scattering amber in delight. Each of them's made pregnant by the Shah of Spring, with fruits of pearl in their body's jewel caskets. Husbandless Marys are pregnant with Messiah, free of vain boasting, eloquent in their silence. Our moon shines wordlessly, joyfully. Tongues find their words from our beauty. Jesus' words flow from Mary's beauty. Adam's speech is shining from that breath. Trusty friend, see abundance in the thanking that nurtures fresh greenery inside the greenery. Don't crawl so easily into your ego's gunny sack. Don't be heedless of those who have ransomed you. Thank you very much.